there is a lot to cover with Jephthah. So uh, I'm going to, again, I'm going to try not to read every verse um, and uh, get to really the big controversial thing with enough time to go through it wisely. Uh, so Judges 10 is where we'll start. We're just going to kind of clip the edge of that chapter and then uh, move into chapter 11 um, and uh, 12, where, where a lot of this in, in, controversial and important things take place. My goal, uh, studied it extensively, my goal is that you have a firm understanding and can speak well of this passage uh, as well, being able to explain it. And I know it's, it's uh, I've already had questions from people, uh, where are we going to land on this? Uh, I've had questions from my own kids all day. Uh, did he sacrifice her? Did he sacrifice her? Did he sa-? They want to know, and I keep telling them you have to wait till tonight and find out. Uh, so uh, we're going to walk through it, but uh, again, lots of historical stuff right at the beginning. I searched long and hard for this image, all right? And uh, I know he's a ruggedly handsome man, uh, and, uh, and he's got piercing eyes. So may you remember Jephthah this way. All right, moving on. I, all I could find other than this are like cartoons that looked like they were drawn by about eight-year-olds. Uh, so I was looking for something a little more animated. Uh, so there's Jephthah. We're going to start at, at 10 and, and just give you background information like we usually do. Again, just to remind you, Israel's fallen into again to this sin cycle where they uh, commit idolatry, they worship idols. In fact, it's going to mention in the passage the Baals and Ashtaroths. They have again forsaken God and followed them. God sells them into hand of, oppre- of an oppressor. This is the Ammon oppression or Ammonites or sometimes they're called the Amorites. Um, but there's a dual oppression going on. So this is one of the rare cases in the book of Judges where we know that there's two oppressions happening at the same time. So at the same time that Ammon is oppressing uh, the eastern tribes of Israel, those tribes that are on the east of the Jordan River, at the same time they're oppressing there, Samson is uh, going to be deliverer over on the western side as Philistia, the Philistines, are attacking and uh, oppressing Israel on that side. So this is a rare case where we know we have uh, dueling oppressions going on at the same time. What I want you to understand about Jephthah is that he is uh, is unique, obviously, very unique story, but I kind of feel like I'm getting redundant saying that in the book of Judges. I mean, the book of Judges has some real bizarre stories, right? Uh, lots of kind of unique things going on. And this, this one is right there near the top, along with the, uh, the one, uh, the guy who did not deal very kindly with his deceased concubine. Um, these are pretty strange events. So we've got two oppressors. We've got Ammon and Philistia. And... Uh, mm, let's see if we can try this again. Mm, this is going to be annoying. All right. This battery full. Well, goodness. All right. We're going to do it the hard way. Um, tell you what, I'll just I'll just bring it I'll just bring it over here. We can do this the hard way, or we can do this the easier way. There we go. All right. So. Uh, does the red light work at least? Oh, look at that. All right. All right. My little red dot works. Uh, so we're looking just really, this is the Jordan River right here, in case you can't see. This is the Jordan River right here. So uh, there's going to be a battle that happens at the fjords or the fords of the uh, Jordan River as Ephraim comes over. Uh, but the main region we're talking about is Gilead. And it's not, it's not a tribe. There's no tribe of Gilead. There's a tribe of Gad. There's a tribe of Reuben, and then half the tribe of Manasseh is up here in the ceiling somewhere. Uh, But this Gilead is just this region, very mountainous region. The Jabbok River comes through there, feeds into the Jordan River. Uh, So it's uh, it's kind of an important area. Ammon lives east uh, of the mountain ranges, and so uh, it's kind of a congested area. really would be a a congested area. This is all present-day Jordan, if you're wondering. 
Um, and so the battle is going to be extensive. It starts out at Mizpah of Gilead, comes all the way down to uh, Medaba, and down even farther uh, to, I can't remember the name of the city, uh, and I can't read it. Uh, it's too fuzzy. Sorry. Um, Arabet or something like that, I believe. And so it's kind of a long battle, uh, although it's recorded in like three verses. A right? typical uh, judge's fashion uh, you get long, drawn-out sections and then really short sections where it's like, and he killed everyone, and then it moves on. And so we, that's one of these. But we got Ammon oppressing here, the Philistias, you know, way over on the western side, and they're being oppressed. And this, as I said, this covers a, a large segment. Really, we could say two tribes are directly affected by Ammon, although the Bible says Ammon would come across the Jordan and raid the eastern side of the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, and so this is, uh, again, it's occurring over a, a large segment of time. The year, something important in case you like dates, but the year of the deliverance here by Jephthah is 1096 B.C. 1096 B.C. That might not mean a lot, and that's fine, but what's going to happen in 1050 is King Saul is going to be anointed king. So we're just about 46 years from Israel having a king and recognizing uh, uh, one ruler over all of the tribes. So we're nearing very quickly the end of Judges. That might seem off to you because we're in Judges uh, 10, 11, and 12. And there's, there's you know, still a, a good 10 chapters left, and we're, we're pretty much through the area or the time period of the Judges. Uh, but that's because some of the, the end chapters are speaking of judges as a whole. And if you want to know more about that and don't remember, go back to the beginning of the series as we talked about the tribe of um, Benjamin and their rebellion. The tribe of Dan as Dan uh, left their area and went all the way to the north and captured their brothers or their tr fellow tribesmen's land. And then uh, all the mistreatments by the Levites, uh, these traveling Levites. All right, so all that, they've been under oppression for about 18 years. That's a long time. Again, this would be by roaming parties who are coming in, stealing things at certain times. We've talked a lot about that. But it really leads to some false worship. And that's kind of the, or it's already been, been and it's exacerbated uh, by the people. So let's, we'll come back to this. I forgot it didn't work. Uh, we'll come back to this in a minute. And uh, we'll just talk about these, the oppression itself uh, again, it was 1096, lasted for about 18 years until Jephthah arose on the scene. And the false worship had led to this oppression. Look at verse 6 with me uh, of chapter 10, Judges 10, verse 6. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroths, the gods of Syria, and the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Now that's extensive. In the past, it's been simply they served the gods of the, of the Canaanites, or they served Baal, or they served Ashtaroth. But here, they're capturing the gods from not even their, the regions directly around them, but regions far away. They're worshiping all kinds of false idols, and it, it's perpetuated deeper sin in the people. So verse 7 says, The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. Uh, from that year, they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. And so they served these false gods, and God kind of sandwiches them between two oppressors and begins to afflict them. In fact, they become severely distressed. Verse 8 and verse 9 both spoke of it. So does verse 14. Jump down to verse 14. Verse 14 says, Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. So God's even mocking Israel. Oh, you want help? Why don't you ask Baal? Why don't you ask Ashtaroth? Maybe they can help you, right? He's kind of mocking them because they've forsaken him for so long. Now, with that said, what else does God do? 
Uh, God says in verse 11, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines? So he says, I tried to deliver you. Verse 15, uh, uh, the children of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do, do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. What a great statement. So in, in their, their false worship, they're extremely distressed. And this is a common theme in the book of Judges, right? Uh, the common theme is, is God warns them, and, and they turn back to him, and they promise they're never going to forsake him again. And then a few years go by and they forsake him again. And he sends them into another deliverer. Now, please remember, this is not the same group of people. It's not the same generation. New generations rise up. Do they pass on their faith to the new generations? No. And they let their new generations uh, marry Canaanites and Ammonites and Moabites and forsake them. And uh, so he, he, he punishes them. And sometimes God sends us warnings. He does it differently, thank goodness, right? We're not being oppressed by Canada. I'm not sure that could happen anyways. Uh, but, uh, well, you know, we're not being oppressed by a foreign entity, but we very willingly uh, suffer the consequences of our own choosing. And God will send sometimes friends, relatives, people who care about us to warn us. He'll give us scripture passages to challenge us to get our hearts right. And sometimes we're stubborn and mule-headed like that. We resist the promptings of God or we ignore the warnings of, of godly people. We avoid instilling or accepting the principles of the Lord. We try to placate God. If, if you get me out of this, then I'll do this right? And we try to play games is really what we're doing. All of it's coming from a rebellious heart. Yet we don't want to willingly, in obedience, obey God until we're kind of forced to. And that, that's kind of how it feels in the book of Judges, right? They, they're disobedient. God punishes them and they say, okay, 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 okay. Now we'll obey. And it'll only last a, a short period of time. Their hearts become desensitized to the truth. And I think the same thing can happen to us if we're honest. We can, we can become dull of hearing. We can come, become desensitized to the truths and the challenges of Scripture. And so what, what desensitizes your heart? And how do you make sure that your heart remains eager to unite with God, to hear God speak? Well, as we said, in verse 11 to 14, the Lord speaks. We don't know how he speaks. It doesn't tell us. Maybe a prophet spoke. Maybe a priest spoke. Maybe they heard an audible voice. We don't know. But somehow they come under conviction as a people, and, and he condemns them of their idolatry and, and mocks them, as we read. And then he, they turn to him. And this one's a little bit unique because often we don't get such a clear picture of the people speaking repentance but they do in verse 15 they said we have sinned I, my bible's got some great punctuation exclamation point we have sinned they acknowledge that they've done wrong and then they they do kind of placate god will do whatever you want god just deliver us please please deliver us we'll do it will do whatever you ask just please get us out of this mess and yet i really really love the line at the end of verse 16, speaking of the Lord, his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Now, I'm not, uh, God never changes. So it's not, we talk about this and there's verses that say the Lord repented, uh, but God doesn't change his mind like you or I change, we change our minds. God is always the same. But what we have here is his heart becomes so burdened. His love for the people is so overwhelming that he, in his love and his grace, wants to give them mercy. And finally, he can give them mercy because they have said, we have sinned. We've repented. 
And so God has been waiting for this moment for them. Of course, he knew it would come. He knows everything. Yet he's been eager to give them love and forgiveness. And now he can because they've turned back to him. I'm not trying to diminish God in any way. I'm not trying to put God down on our level in any way. I'm trying to elevate the fact that God's love is pure. And we see it here. And, and, and so God uh, gives in his, gr- in his perfections of grace, he gives them what they do not deserve, shows them mercy, gives them grace, and, and provides for them a deliverer. And that's what the Lord wants for us. The, the truth of the Lord, as we talked about this morning, does not change. People are fickle. We're fickle. We change, but God does not change. And when we have failed, God is faithful. And when we are down and struggling, God is still the same. And when we are uncertain about what to do, God already has the future worked out. And these truths should strengthen us. We should grow in our knowledge of the Lord this way. Well, now we have Jephthah on the scene in verse number one. It says, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. But he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead begot Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you were the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went, up, went out raiding with him. And so we have a kind of an unlikely deliverer. Uh, he comes from a terrible home life. Right? This should be encouraging for some people who didn't come, don't have a really nice polished background. Uh, they don't come from a, a, a wonderful home life, didn't have the ideal Christian upbringing. It doesn't really matter. Here, Jephthah, uh, he comes from a, uh, he's an illegitimate son, right? Hey, he's got a father who's not serious about spiritual things, a mother who we never hear spoken of again. He's got half brothers who hate him and literally drive him out of the home. And that's not a healthy home. And yet God calls him a mighty man of valor in verse one. The same term that was used of Boaz and the same term that was used of Gideon, a mighty man, a man of incredible honor and value. What a statement for a guy who had such a rough upbringing. And so he's expelled from the home in verse 3. And he surrounds himself with worthless men. And he becomes really an unusual deliverer. Uh, you, uh, uh, the idea here of worthless men is people who are void of any purpose. Right? We saw the same term used uh, of Abimelech. He hired worthless men. And they went around raiding their own people, stealing from their own people. Now, it doesn't say all that about Jephthah, but he does form a raiding party. And verse 3, they, they, they go out raiding with him. Now, where they're raiding, I don't know. But I, I'm just going to use, uh, I think, some basic logic and common sense and say they're not raiding the people of Gilead. Otherwise, the people of Gilead wouldn't come to him and say, hey, we want to make you the captain, which they're about to do. So I think what he's doing, I think Jephthah is raiding Ammon. He's raiding the oppressors. And, and I, I'm going to tell you right now, I like Jephthah. I like him a lot. He's, he's a man of strong character. Whether we get to the end of the story and you agree with what he did was right or wrong, he was a man of strong character. And when he gave his word, he was going to keep his word. So I think he's out raiding not Israel or Gilead, but raiding Ammon. So verse 4, it came to pass after a time that the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And so it was when the people of Ammon made war against Israel that the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Then they said to Jephthah, come and be our commander that we may fight against the people of Ammon. So Jephthah said to the elders, did you not hate me? And expel me from my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And so they request that he become their deliverer. Now I want you to notice just a couple things. If we talked about other deliverers, God has called these other deliverers. But here, this is the first time we have where a man, we don't have any indication he's been called by God. 
he's requested by the elders of Gilead to be the leader, the deliverer. I think because he's, some, he's a, a military man, right? He leads a, a very successful raiding party, apparently, and uh, seems like the logical guy that you want in charge. A little bit off his hinges, maybe, willing to take some chances, but a, 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 a man that you want behind him in time of war. And so he agrees to lead the army. They make the request, but he, he places some uh, contingencies upon this. He will only be, be the leader of the war party if they make him the leader of the tribe afterwards. He doesn't want to be humiliated again. He's been driven out once. He doesn't want to be driven out twice. He's been rejected by his own people, and he's not going to let that happen again. Part of the reason I like Jephthah is because of what he says to the leaders. Look at verse 9. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon and the Lord delivers them to me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do according to your words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. First time the Lord's been mentioned here in this story. And Jephthah's the one who brings it up. He's like, if, you're, if we're doing this, you're going to make a vow to God. You're going you're to swear to the Lord that you'll keep your word. And if the Lord gives victory, and so he's acknowledging it's not in his control, it's in the Lord's control, the Lord's hands. If the Lord gives the victory, then I'm going to be the head. And so they, they do. They make him the head. They put him in charge. And immediately he begins to attempt a negotiation with Ammon. Now, we're not going to read all this because it's really long. But I will say this. Jephthah can, can talk a little bit of good trash. He talks some trash to the king of Ammon, and I kind of like it. All right, he tells him what for, gives him a little what for. So verse 12, we'll just read a little bit. Now Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon saying, what do you have against me that you've come to fight against me in the land? And the king of the people of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now therefore restore these lands peaceably. Does this sound slightly familiar? Okay, what's he say? 350 years ago, you people took some land from us and we want it back. Now listen, they didn't take much land from Ammon. Uh, they took land from the Canaanites. In fact, they tried to bypass Ammon, but Ammon was really difficult. Ammon uh, made threats against Israel. And, and so uh, really from verse 12 to 28, Jephthah's just reminding them of history. They have a skewed version of what history is, and he's correcting them according to the word of the Lord. And so he gives all kinds of dates and places. He said they came to the land of Edom and the land of Moab, and they, they tried to pass around it. They camped on the other side. Uh, and they said, we tried to avoid you. We tried to help you, but you turned your back on us, and now this is what you get. And here we are, you know, a couple thousand years later, and the same thing's happening again. And so he, he just reminds them that Ammon never possessed. And I remind you that, that uh, this map, Ammon never possessed this land over here. And yet they're raiding into there. Ammon just has one small section here. And yes, Israel took this section right here after they sent Balaam out to try and convince, uh, to prophesy against them and and israel had to defend themselves so they were attacked and in the process uh god gave them what they earned now all right we can, if you want to talk philosophy of military warfare i would be happy to do that uh but we didn't used to return land to the to those who were defeated uh and we can talk about that another time all right i want to get to the real point that's not the point of the message here they talk back and forth, back and forth. And, uh, you know, Jephthah says, hey, if, if this is such a big deal to you, why don't you get your gods to save you? You know, that kind of stuff. 
And then they go to battle. Uh, who, who would have thought? It didn't work out. Peace talks didn't work out. Verse 29, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. So that's the first time that this has happened. He is God's deliverer. And we now know it. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he advanced toward the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you, Lord, will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then, I will, uh, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. There it is. Vow. A promise to God that if I win the battle... And I return home, the first thing that comes out of the door, I will burn as a sacrifice to you. That's how it reads. So he makes this vow before God. I want you to just take note, he is eager for God's help. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Even when he speaks this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. He does not want to go to battle without God's help. That is a good thing. He's taken a stand for the Lord way back in verse 9 and verse 10. He's spoken the truth for the Lord, and now he makes this vow. He'll sacrifice as a burnt offering the first thing that comes out of his house. And I just remind you of the um, homes in Bible times. Animals would often sleep indoors in the first room. Think of it like a mud room, maybe. They would sleep in the first room. It would add warmth to the home. The animals would add warmth to the home. So it's natural that a, uh, it wouldn't be unnatural, I should say, that a, a, a lamb or a, a sheep or a goat or a bull would come out that door when he got home. It's not unnatural that that would happen. Now, we probably know the rest of the story. All right, so let's, let's go through the, the verses on war. Verse 32 and 33. It's quick. So Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he defeated them from Arar as far as Mineth, 20 cities, and to Abel Karamim, with a gr very great, great slaughter, Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. If only wars would last that long, right? <laughs> Two verses took me about, after I stumbled, took me about eight seconds to read. Not a lot. I mean, what's it say? So they fought. The Lord won. He defeated 20 cities. That's the end of Ammon. It's basically summarized. There's the cliff notes. Four seconds. There's not a lot to say. And it's because the battle, I mean, God did it. Yeah, he used Jephthah. He used the, the, the people. We don't have any idea if any, if any Israelis died in this. But Ammon sure did. And they were subdued, completely defeated, and now under the control of Israel. A very fast battle, apparently. Fast enough that it only takes two verses. Any questions about the battle? I mean, I don't know. That's, that's, that's pretty simple. If only it was, everything was that easy. All conflict could be resolved in two verses. That'd be wonderful. All right, now the controversy. Verse 34. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her, that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. What a horrible statement to make. I picture her as a teenager. Uh, what a horrible statement to, get, uh, to make to a teenage girl. You are among those who trouble me. Uh, that might be my new phrase. Uh, hopefully I don't have to use it. Right? I, I mean, oh, what a horrible thing to say. She comes out. She's got a tambourine, a tim, a sim, or a timble, timble. Yeah, whatever. Clangy thing in her hand. Right? She's dancing. She's rejoicing. Her father has come home. He's the conquering hero. And the first thing he says, why did it have to be you? You're the one who had to come out. And why? Because he made the vow. And he tells her. 
Now notice the words. Again, Scripture is very concise. We don't have time for all the nuances all the time. But notice he says this to her. I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. So she said to him, My father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Amma. She doesn't hesitate. Whatever you said, Dad, you do it. Because we follow, in this home, we follow the Lord. And you gave your word, so you better do it. I don't know if he explained to her what his vow was or not before she made that statement, but she makes it. He immediately feels remorse and he's bothered. And yet she responds in faith. She's trusting the all-knowing Lord for whatever her dad has promised. And she agrees to the vow. In fact, we keep reading, the vow then gets carried out. And this is, of course, where the conflict is. Verse 37. Then she said to her father, assuming now he has told her what the vow is, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months that I may go and wander in the mountains, bewail my virginity, my friends and I. So he said to her, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity in the mountains. And it was so that Uh, at the end of two months that she returned to her father and she carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed, she knew no man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each uh, each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. All right, so she bewails or laments her commitments for two months and then she completes the vow. Notice that's what it says. It says, he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man. There's two views. That one supposes that this is a rash vow, and he carries it out by burning her as a human sacrifice to the Lord. As he said, whatever comes out of my house, I will give as a burnt offering. So that's one, the language of the vow. And by the way, the language of the vow in the passage fits well with this interpretation because he does say uh, in, in verse 31, uh, I will offer it up as a burnt offering. And so we know, by the way, that this would even fit in the narrative of Judges. Right? Is Judges known as being a morally good time period? No, everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. There's, this isn't the f- first time even that people have sacrificed their children in Israel. Although it's commanded against, there have been many times where mistreatment of one's own children has occurred, even in the book of Judges. And so it does seem to fit uh, the culture, I could say, of Judges. All right. That's one view. The second view is that it, she, she took a vow of celibacy. Uh, she made a lifelong commitment to the Lord to remain in service uh, celibate at the tabernacle. And this view uh, doesn't at first seem to fit. I want to give you three reasons, though, against human sacrifice. I do have... There we go. Three reasons against human sacrifice. Um, To offer human sacrifice first is a violation against the law of God. All right, this is a really important one, and it's really simple. Leviticus 18.21 forbids human sacrifice, as does Leviticus 20, verse 2 through 5. And I want to read that one for you. Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever, the, whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel who give, gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. 
The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from this man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and I will cut off him from his people and all who prostitute themselves or, or commit harlotry with Molech. Now, Molech is a god uh, that was worshipped in, in uh, uh, um, the Canaanites, and they would, it was a statue, a golden statue that had arms held out, and you would take, well, not you, hopefully, the wicked idolaters would take their, build a fire under the hands of Molech and take their children and put it in the arms of Molech and burn their children alive in worship of that false god. And here God condemns that. And notice the language. He says, if anyone does that, not only does that man deserve to die, you must stone him. But if you choose to kind of, I didn't see anything, I didn't know my neighbor was doing that, and you turn a blind eye to it, then you will die and all your family's gonna die too. God absolutely in no way permits human sacrifice. It is against his very nature. We are made in his image. And to defile the image of God is wrong. And so God outright condemns human sacrifice. So that's my first reason why I don't think that Jephthah offered his daughter as a human sacrifice. It's against scripture. And everything we've read so far about Jephthah, he is a mighty man an honorable, valiant man who obeys God. God wouldn't say that, couldn't say that if he was murderous and offering his own daughter in human sacrifice. By the way, if in case those two passages weren't enough, it also appears in Deuteronomy 12.31 and Deuteronomy 18.10. Four times God condemns human sacrifice. All right, next, Jephthah respected God. I don't think he could have done this because he respected God. To sacrifice a human would have been, as I said, disrespectful to God in his image. We bear his image. And our bodies are described, in, especially in the New Testament, as living temples. Uh, our, our body is to be the place, the inhabitants of the Lord. And so therefore, the things that we do to and with our bodies should honor and glorify God. And, and Jephthah could not have done that and still honored the Lord and neither could his daughter. And third, the priest should not, I would hope, would not have helped him offer a person in sacrifice. A at least if they were godly, they wouldn't do this. And there's no indication read the passage again and go home. If you're, if you're not sure yet, uh, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. But I, I challenge you, read the scripture again. You never find anywhere where it says he sacrificed his daughter. It says he kept his vow. And so let me give you four reasons why I think it's a vow of lifelong dedication. First, he permitted his daughter to lament this life change. In verse 37 and verse 38, she says, I will keep this vow that you made, but let me go up with my friends and lament uh, my, my, uh, my change of life. That's really what she's saying. She's going to be celibate the rest of her life. Not only that, she's going to serve in the temple or tabernacle for the rest of her life. This is going to be her existence from this point on which I think is part of the reason why Jephthah um, spoke so harshly to her when she came out, out the door. He says, you've troubled me by her being the first one. Now, she didn't know. But what, is it, what does Scripture emphasize here? She is his only daughter. She's his only chance for his name, his legacy to continue on. He will not have any grandchildren. His family name will end with him. And so she goes to lament that. This is a huge shift for her life. I mean, I'm pretty sure that most girls grow up dreaming of what their life will be like, and this is going to change it. In one instant, she'll be a servant in the tabernacle the rest of her life. We also know she didn't marry. That's the second reason. She never married. In fact, it says at the end, in verse 39, 
She knew no man. And that's the idea is she never got married. A third reason is there, is she, there are people who are devoted to service in the tabernacle. It existed. It doesn't say that's what she's doing here. So I, I, I will admit there's a, a, a little bit of an argument from, from silence here. How, however, Exodus 38.8 talks about women serving dedicated to the ta- tabernacle. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22 talks about that. And Luke chapter 2, verse th- uh, 36 and 37. Talk about women serving in the the temple, or in this case, the tabernacle. So there were women who were dedicated to a life of celibacy and service to the Lord. And lastly, the terminology in Hebrew can actually read as an option. And I want you to go back to verse 31 to see this. Uh, 11, Judges 11, verse 31. He says, this is Jephthah making the vow, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. And the terminology at the very end where he says, shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up, the word and there could actually be equally translated or which doesn't sound like a big deal to us. And, or, does it really matter? Well, let's read it with or. He says at the end, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, or I will offer it up as a burnt sacrifice or a burnt offering. Hebrew is not as precise, it's more poetic, but not as precise as Greek. And so this word, it's just a, a, what is that, a conjunction? It can just be uh, translated multiple ways according to the context. Could be or, could be and. And if you read it or, it makes perfect sense. He says, either I'm going to give whatever comes to the door, I'm going to give it to the Lord, or I'm going to offer it and sacrifice to the Lord. All right. With that said, I think it should be easily understood and noted that even if Jephthah did sacrifice his daughter, the Bible does not approve of that. So even if you say, no, 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 I'm sticking with the language, how it is, Uh, it certainly appears he offered her as a sacrifice, then let me just warn you, God wouldn't have been pleased with that, couldn't have been pleased with that. Uh, So if if there's no mention of it, that would have been a sin. And that's why it's important, I think, to be good students of the word. We must know scripture so that we know what God expects of us, right? If you you weren't a good student of the word and you just read that, you'd be like, man, oh, oh, harsh. Killed his own daughter, sacrificed her. But there's so many scriptures that condemn that. It cannot be that and have Jephthah remain in good standing with the Lord. All right. It also holds us to a high standard, right? We have to be careful what we say. Here's my takeaway. Here's the application. We better be careful what we say. I I was joking about this on Wednesday night. We were talking about parenting uh, from the book of Proverbs. And I just mentioned that I was really... Man, perfect parent when I was like 21, 22, before I was married, before I had kids, and you see other people with their children, and you're like, when I have kids, I'm not going to do that. I won't make that mistake. Ha! Man, these people have no idea what they're doing. You wait till I'm a parent, and now I'm a parent, and I'm like, good night! What's going on half the time, right? Parenting is the hardest thing possible. All right, with that said, don't make rash vows. God tells us, he warns us to be wise. Don't make rash vows and these commitments. We're warned about making care, making careful, uh, taking careful attention to make sure the things we say matter to God and are honoring to the Lord. So let's be careful with what we say. All right, with that, move on. To, we're not done. The story's only half over. It gets more chaotic from here. Chapter 12 begins, and we have the biggest pity party that I think we've ever seen in Scripture. And it's from Ephraim, who's already done it. They've already done it one time. Remember the story of Gideon? Gideon uh, fights. They have this great victory. 300 men, they pursue them. And after they pursue them, the battle's pretty much done. And what happens? The men of Ephraim come down from the mountain and say, whoa, why weren't you going to invite us to the battle? We would have helped you. Come on, Gideon. Well, they do it again. They do it. Ephraim, come on. Look at verse one. 
Then the men of, of Ephraim, or you could pronounce it Ephraim, gathered together, crossed over towards Zaphon, and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the people of Ammon and did not call us to go with you? We will burn down your house. We will burn your house down uh, on you with fire. What in the world is wrong with these people? I think that often when I read the book of Judges. So here we go. Uh, there we go. We've got, I, I shrunk, shrunk, zoomed in a little bit here, because uh, I mentioned e, uh, Ephraim, or Ephraim's over on the west side. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, the battle has, has concluded. He's back at Mizpah of Gilead, where he's leading from. And all of a sudden, Ephraim kind of comes over here and says, hey, what are you doing? We wanted to be part of the battle. We could have enjoyed some of the spoils of war, but no, you kept it all for yourself. And Jephthah comes through again with this trash talk, I might, I might add. So verse two, and Jephthah said to them, my people and I were in a great struggle with the people of Ammon. And when I called you, you did not deliver me out of their hands. So when I saw that you would not deliver me, I took my life in my hands and crossed over against the people of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me now Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim so he says hey you know they were coming over here all the time they were for 18 years they've been bothering us where were you where were you you didn't want to help then then he says I even asked you for help and I think the idea is when he was a raiding uh, a raider marauder they didn't help him then either. And so he says, you better be careful what you say. Don't talk to me like that. You don't know who I am. And so they start fighting a battle. And this is a, this is a battle we get numbers for. And it's a bad battle. So he says in verse 4, no, uh, Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim. And the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they said, you Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim uh, uh, among the Ephraimites and among the um, Manassites. The Gileadites seized the fords, that's here at Adam. They seized the fords of the Jordan River, of the Jordan before the Ephraimites arrived. And when any Ephraimite who escaped said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to him, are you an Ephraimite? If, if he said no, then they would say to him, then say, Shibboleth. And he would say, Sibboleth. Like I said, you better be careful what you say. So... So they send a little raiding party and they get over to the edge of the Jordan and they take the, the ford, the water crossing, and anyone comes through and says, I'm just going back to Ephraim. Nope, just been over here visiting. Were you fighting? The, I wasn't fighting in the battle. All right, say Shibboleth, Thibboleth, and then they would kill him. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This is crazy. The things that happen in the book of Judges, they are bizarre. No, 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 notice, notice. Uh, then they would take him and kill him at the fords of the Jordan. There fell at that time 42,000 Ephraimites. Man, these, these tribal wars are brutal. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried among the cities of Gilead. <laughs> this actually makes me wonder about how we get our nose out of joint when our expectations aren't met. Ephraim, as I said, they have a history of doing this. They did this with Gideon as well. They come late to the game. They have expectations of getting some of the bounty of the war, maybe kind of helping mop up at the fringes, you know, look like they participated when they hardly did. And they have these expectations that they're going to be received, even when they show up and say, we're going to burn you alive because you didn't invite us to the fight. I mean, How? warped is their thinking and yet all right, none of us would do that all right and hopefully we can all say shibboleth uh give me the new password to get into the church no i'm just kidding <laughs> i mean 
we do, we do the same thing in a lesser way. We, we set up expectations of practice that we ourselves are blind to meeting sometimes. We expect people to, to behave a certain way, act a certain way, and then when they don't meet that, we get upset. Meanwhile, we, we sometimes don't even meet those expectations. Or you could say we have standards. We have standards that we want other people to hold to, but we ourselves struggle to hold them when no one's looking. Or we expect other people to take risks, but we want to, to cruise in late to the, to the game, ready to, to judge and condemn. Or we want people to minister to our children, but we're not very eager or excited about ministering to their children. You know, all these application points, there, there should be a level of grace with other people. There was no grace with the Ephraimites. And they kind of got what was coming to them. We're commanded over and over again in Scripture to get the, the beam out of our own eyes. We're told to, re, to respond with love, which according to 1 Corinthians 13, love thinks good of other people. We're reminded to love covers a multitude of sin, and yet all of these things are hard to do when we get our feelings hurt or, or when we have expectations that go unmet. So that's my takeaway from, from the Ephraimites. Make sure you have clear speech and make sure that you speak kindly to people. How excited are you to extend grace to other people? I think that's a really important question to ask ourselves. Do I look for opportunities to show grace to others? So listen, this is, I admit it, this is a hard passage. It is strange, to say the least. And yet, if our faith is founded on, on the truth, then we know certain things about God and what He expects. And we should make sure that our expectations match and mirror the Lord's. And so let us speak with, with grace, show grace to other people because there's days when we're going to need it ourselves. All right. If you have questions about Jephthah, I would like to answer them after the service, but our service has gone long enough. So I'm just going to conclude with prayer. We'll conclude for the night and then you can help stack chairs. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we know that the Bible is full of misfits. And if we lived during that time and the Bible spoke of us, there would be some very strange things probably that could be recorded about us. Our errors, our discrepancies, the problems that we create of our own self Lord, I pray we would be people of our word, that when we say we will do something, we'll do it, that we too could be called mighty men or women of valor, but that we would also be filled with grace, looking for opportunity to extend grace to other people, to the honor and the glory of your name. So we thank you for this day. We thank you for what we've been able to, to study and to learn I pray we would grow from it so that this week we apply it in our lives. Whether it be moments this week where we need to pause and seek uh, rest in you, standing still, casting our cares, our anxieties upon you, and calming our, our soul through your word. Or whether there be times where we have an opportunity to reach out to others and extend grace to them, Lord, that we would be diligent at both for your honor. We thank you for this great day that we had. May you get the praise for the fruit that it brings about in our lives. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen.